Thank you for tuning in to the Excellence Exchange Podcast. I'm your host, Sharon Hulse, president of ERG Executive Search, a nationwide executive search firm based in Appleton, Wisconsin. On today's episode, we are thrilled to welcome an award-winning franchise coach, a best-selling author, and a beacon of wisdom and wit in the world of entrepreneurship. Our guest distinguished career of over two decades as a Fortune 15 executive and now CEO has empowered thousands of professionals to escape the clutches of a draining nine-to-five job and re-energize their lives and careers by discovering new doorways of opportunity. Hailed as the consummate connector by her peers, her authenticity, relatability, and self-deprecating sense of humor have inspired business owners throughout the country and the world to find their life's vocation. Prepare yourself for an episode filled with inspiration, strategic insight, and perhaps even some tough love. Please welcome the CEO of the Franchise Pros and author of The Right Franchise for You, Faizun Kamal. Welcome, Faizun. Oh my gosh, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. And wow, thank you for those very kind words, but don't believe everything you hear, Sharon. Well, I'm going to tell you what, based on everything that I have read about you, every word of that is true. And one of the things I love is that you very much um, use your sense of humor to deliver sometimes tough messages. And I love that about you already just watching um, all of your great LinkedIn content. And and I'm, I'm so happy that both of us had won the Enterprising Women Award, which is how we ultimately got connected. Yeah. So yeah. everything in, in the universe happens for a reason. And I love that. So let's start with uh, I just want to say I'm so fascinated by your story. I mean, and you have had an extraordinary impact on so many people, just just watching all of the things you do. So tell our listeners about your company, the Franchise Pros. How did you begin, you know, to get into franchising and helping people to understand that that's a career path? Oh, wow. What a fantastic question. And I'm just so delighted to be here with you today, Sharon. Hmm. Um I started the franchise pros about at this point, seven years ago. And I started it when I found myself adrift because I had gotten laid off from a fortune 15 company that I was at, that I had been at for about eight years prior. And I wasn't really sure what my path forward was going to look like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the path is never linear. It's never straight. Mm -hmm. There's always twists and turns. And I took my twists and turns and I ended up in the world of franchises. Um, I think a better way to describe it would be I fell headlong into franchising Mm -hmm. and I fell deeply, deeply hard in love. Um, I was fascinated. I'd always been fascinated by businesses and I had finally found an industry that was not a multi-level marketing. It was Mm -hmm. not some sort of pyramid scheme, like, you know, sell the heck out of your friends and family, and then you run out of people to sell stuff to. It wasn't, right? So because, and I say this because Mm -hmm. I, when I first began looking at franchising, Sharon, I was very, um, I was very critical and I was Mm -hmm. very suspicious would be the right word because it just felt too good to be true right? And I tried to see what holes I could poke in it. And I couldn't. And the more I learned, the more I realized that really there is a way in this country, if you are strategic and thoughtful about what you want your career, and then by definition, your life to look like, there's a very distinctive path that you can create for yourself and your family. And that is what I realized. And I began the franchise pros, which over the last uh, seven years, Sharon, it has grown into what's now a full service franchise consulting, development, and sales platform. What does that mean even? Uh, it means very simply, we work with only two types of clients. Our mm-hmm. first group of clients are people just like myself, corporate refugees, people who've been kicked out of corporate America, mm-hmm. right? They've gotten laid off or they have decided to transition out or they have retired, what, what have you. And they're now saying, I'm out, but I'm not ready to retire. I still have a long, full life to lead. And you know, in this iteration of my life, I think I would like to start a business, but I hear starting a business is risky. I hear franchises de-risk 
that process. But I don't know what the right franchise for me would be. We work with those clients to help them find the right franchise mm -hmm. to get into. First group of clients. Second group of clients are business owners. Again, just like me now. Mm -hmm. Business owners who have taken their business to a certain point of growth where they're saying, man, I have an amazing product or I have an amazing service and I want to take this national. And we help those business owners turn their business into a franchise brand. And that third piece of the service that we do, the franchise sales, we then become their sales team to recruit franchisees and to help grow that emerging franchise brand. That's a fabulous story. And I love that you took something that some, quite frankly can paralyze a lot of people, a layoff, especially when you're with a, you know, for Fortune 15 company um, and you took it and you made it your own and you you created something that's such an amazing service and gift to other people who are very much in the same place you are. It, you know, one of the things that I loved about your story and why I felt so connected to you is, you know, that's a lot of what my book's about. It's about people who are very successful, but they they don't love what they do anymore. And they're trying to figure out what's next or where, who can I be? So it, one of the things I loved the most is the corporate refuge, refugee term, because I thought that's really what is so true that happens to people is whether it's a forced layoff or you're just stuck, right? You're just no passion, no energy. I got to get my mojo back. Yes, it, it is at the corporate refugee and it's figuring out what is the next step. And, and you know, having had a franchise at one point, I, I agree that franchising can be a great springboard for a lot of people to become business owners. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that transition, corporate America to entrepreneurship, because you again, you yourself started a business. It's not like the franchise pros was a franchise. You started this business, right? What kind of challenges did you face in the beginning? How did you overcome them? Kind of help the people who are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. What was that like for you in the beginning? Oof. So I talk about this in my book, Sharon. And, you know, I will, I will liken this to my own dark night of the soul, 40 days in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, because think about it this way. And I think many people who've gone through this process of getting laid off they will identify very intimately with this. You are, you know, by any measure, any external measure, you're a successful adult, right? Mm -hmm. You probably have a family. You probably have mortgage, a mortgage and bills to pay. You may have kids in college or getting ready to or graduating from. Um, and you lead a very busy life. You've also gotten used to a certain lifestyle. Your family has, mm -hmm. right? Just because you don't have a job, doesn't mean the bills have stopped coming in. So you are in this, so I, this is what I call it. When you are no longer who you were, but you're also no longer, but you're also not yet who you're supposed to be, between the two, Sharon, lies a space that's pregnant with possibility. Mm -hmm. Yet I find so many people they don't look at it as a period of possibility. It becomes a space where it's inhabited by deep fears, by uncertainty, right? A lot of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Let me scramble and get the first opportunity that I can because, you know, the bills are continuing to come and I don't want to mm -hmm. dip into my retirement account, what have you. I think that is fundamentally a very uh, wonky way of looking at mm -hmm. this because my friend, what these individuals are doing is not just looking for their next job. This is the next phase of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, why do I say that? When I was in corporate and towards the end, Sharon, I was a mean wife. I was mean to my husband. I would come home and I would be mean to him. Why? He was an easy target. So all the stresses that I had at the workplace I had to take it out on someone and he was an easy target. You know, our daughter, she's turning 10 in August now. She was maybe um, 17, 18 months. This is a literal baby. I, on more than one occasion, it doesn't make me proud to say this, 
I have lost my temper with a little baby because I was tired. I was exhausted. I was stressed about mm -hmm. some email that came in on a Saturday and, you know, half of my Saturday would now be gone. I say this to say to you, unfortunately, what happens in the workplace does not stay in the workplace. We carry 100%. it back home with us. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the people who remember how mean you used to be is your family. It's not your job, right? I realized that. Um, it wasn't a fun realization, right? So when you talk about, you know, um, sort of tough love coaching, the reason that is my style is because I'm very introspective and probably the most critical of myself. And I bring that same spirit and I bring that same love to the clients that we work with to say, look, if you need me to hold your hand and coddle you, I probably am not the best person for you. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of other coaches who will do that. But if you would like to have somebody who looks you in your eyeballs and says, look, Sharon, here's where you are. You are 52 years old. You have done A, B, and C in your career. You are an incredibly accomplished woman. Now, you have one of two choices. You can go back into the world that has given you so much unhappiness. And that is a fool's proposition because you are expecting to find happiness where you first lost it. So maybe we shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe look at another path and there is a way that we can de-risk that path for you. And this is what it looks like. Well, and thank you for being honest about that. It, you and I, our worlds are so parallel. Uh, we call it a professional midlife crisis, much like the other one, only it's yes. professional. And it, it's so true. It is... People are so unhappy and they do, they take it out. The stresses come out in the people that you love the most. That's where, where it, it displays itself. And thank you for sharing that because we all know that, you know, and, and sometimes I think it's really hard to just be honest about the fact that if you don't change what's going on in here, it's not yeah. going to change any, all of it, right? You, you have to find, and, and I always tell people, you can find passion and energy in your career. Sometimes you have to leave, sometimes you don't, but you have to do what speaks to your heart. Because when you do what speaks to your heart and your natural gifts, that's when you're going to be successful. So thank you for sharing that and being honest. So uh, again, I, I love all the, the what, what you say speaks so much to me. The whole description of a career trajectory is strategically coloring outside the career lines. It, again, it is thinking about things in a way that the, the obvious answer is to continue to do where you earn the most money, right? Mm -hmm. Because you already know it. Um, and, and people will do that. They'll, they'll go back into the same path, knowing that ultimately they're going to end up with the same unrest or unhappiness. You know, I always tell people they end up getting so far away from what it is they love about yes. the business because they end up sitting in board meetings, solving problems all day long. And they, mm -hmm. they miss that fulfillment. So what does strategically coloring outside the career lines mean for you and your business? Um, let me answer you this way, Sharon. I love the question. Um, our daughter is Z, so she's turning 10 next month. Um, I was very conscious when she was a baby and as she was a toddler and she grew up and she's very artistically inclined, so art is her thing. Never once, not once, as her mother, and I would make sure that others around her wouldn't do this either, Never once did I ever say, Z, mama, color inside the lines. Make sure that the picture looks neat. Don't color outside the lines. Here's why I say that. I use that as a metaphor, Sharon, for we, we graduate from college, we enter into our jobs, our first jobs, <clears throat> and then we follow the career ladder. Every job we step into, understand you're handed a job description. So think of those as the lines, right? The framework, the boundary within which you, in your role, are expected to operate. And you should not stray outside those lines. Now, the stuff that you're expected to do, Sharon, may or may not float your boat. It may not be exactly within your wheelhouse. It may not even be anywhere close to what it is you love to do. And I get that that's a fact. I get that people need jobs. But here's what I suggest. And I say this, especially for someone who has zero desire to ever start a business. 
So if somebody, if your listener today is listening to this and they say, well, that's great, Faizun, but look, I just always want to have a job. I've always been an employee. I have zero desires to start a business. Then this is for you. Whatever job you find yourself in, figure out those two, three things that you know would just change the trajectory of each day, each week, each month, each year, if you were able to incorporate a little bit of that in there. So, you know, I, I'm trying to think of an example. I'll use a silly example. Maybe in your deepest heart of heart, what you love to do and what you are known for within your friends and family circle is Sharon throws the best parties ever, period, end of story. Well, okay, but she's a research analyst in her job. How the hell is she going to do this? Well, mm -hmm. could you volunteer and say, folks, we have a Christmas party. We have a this party, that party. I will be the one that takes the lead on that. Whatever those little creative things that might be that helps you expand the scope of your current job description, in my book, is coloring outside the lines. That's one. The second piece to this, Sharon, that I would share with you, there is no rule, there's no law that says that somebody who barely knows you, doesn't know you, has never interacted with you, says to you, Sharon, I need you to play within this space and you shall never stray outside of it. That never sat well with me. I always rebelled against that. And by the way, that is something that I find happens to be one of the leading traits of somebody who has that entrepreneurial spirit in them. Mm -hmm. They're always looking to color outside the, outside the lines. Absolutely. Well, even I think as a business owner, you know, I, I've often said to my team, you know, first of all, when people work to their natural gifts, they excel. So yes. figuring out what your natural gifts are, you can excel in your career. So if they love to write or if they love uh, marketing or whatever that is, incorporate, like you said, incorporate it into your current day. But I've also said, and I, I talked to my daughter who now is 23, you know, I tell her a lot, be the one who raises your hand, even if you're not sure yes. what exactly it is you're doing. Because I said, people love people who take initiative. Yes. So say, you know what? I don't necessarily know exactly what I'm going to do but I'll figure it out. And I'd love to be part of the committee or I'd love to take it on and I'll do the research and I'll figure it out because it would be fun for me to take that on. People who own businesses love employees like that because it yes. shows initiative and it shows desire <clears throat> and all of those things. All right. I want to talk about your book. So your book's title is The Right Franchise for You, Escape the Nine to Five, Generate Wealth and Live Life on Your Own Terms, all of which sound like the total recipe to success for me. <laughs> so it was even nominated by Forbes for exclusive inc inclusion into their executive library for executives, which I didn't even know they had. It's amazing. Uh, what inspired you to write it, first of all? And then who should read your book? Let's talk about if somebody's going to going to listen to the podcast and they're going to go out and they're going to pick up your book. Who's your reader? Mm, wow. What inspired me to write the book? Um when I found myself in that transition phase, Sharon, mm -hmm. I had been laid off, but I had not yet started the company. So that space in between, it was easily one of the most difficult periods in my adult life um, because it raises a lot of stuff inside you, right? It's a very, very, very elegant technical term called stuff. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff was, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. Oh, you know, I know it was through no fault of my own that I got laid off because the company was having rifts all over the place. But still, I feel a little bit, pardon my language, shitty about myself. Right. You know, do I have worth? I mean, I thought I was an accomplished adult, but like here I am sitting on my couch at 11 a.m. on a Wednesday. Why, why'd they pick me, right? Right. Why'd they pick me? So you go through all of this stuff in your head, right? And the process wasn't easy. But that process made me who I am today. And so when I started my company, Sharon, and I wrote the book at this point, I think um, this is now five years ago, four or five years ago. I wrote the book because I wanted to share, you know, the very honest way in which I said to you, I wasn't really nice to my own family. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to write about the yucky parts of a huge life transition, such as you got laid off and now what do you do? Mm -hmm. It's not all, you know, cake and unicorn. 
It's the good not. stuff obviously comes, but there's a place where a space where it isn't all that great. I wanted to be able to talk about that. Very importantly, I also wanted to let people know by no means should you feel that you are the first person who's gone through this, and by no means will you be the last person that ever goes through this. There's a community of us, and these feelings that you're going through, you're not that unique. You're not that special. Don't think that. We all do. We all go through this stuff. Um, who's the book for? I get this question a lot, by the way. The book is actually not just for somebody who's looking to buy into a franchise. It's not for them. You read out the title of the book, and I will, I will mention the very last phrase in the title of the book, which is, live life on your terms. Sharon, franchising is only the vehicle through which I live my calling. But my calling, my purpose, is to be able to help another human be able to figure out how they can live life on their terms. So for anyone who's in that phase where they're thinking, again, doesn't mean you have to buy a business or start a business, wherever you might happen to be in your life or career, this is a handbook for somebody to try and figure out for themselves, first and foremost, where am I headed? What does this next chapter look like for me? And is this something that I really truly want to live? Because ultimately, I think the best thing about living life on your terms is the time freedom that you get, right? We, we talk about money, we talk about wealth, we talk about expensive houses and cars and vacations, and those are all great. I'm not knocking those. But ultimately, in my book, the true signifier of wealth is the wealth of time freedom, time that allows you to do what you want to do with whomever you want to do it. It's so funny. I always think of, so one of my favorite quotes is a Zig Ziglar quote. Now I'm dating myself and thank you for saying I'm 52. That's not even close. But, but one of the things it's when I do the things I ought to do when I ought to do them, the day will come when I can do the things I want to do when I want to do them. So mm -hmm. very much, I think we are sisters from another mister. I, honest to goodness, I, I, do, and I feel like I have met, I have met my, my soul sister here. Um, okay, so let's talk about your franchise coach. You see entrepreneurs every day. And entrepreneurs can be a handful. Let's be real. We're you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. We have we have a very strong mindset. We are dominant. We are um, you know, we have all these crazy ideas and we're always thinking about new things. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see in the whole entrepreneurial community that maybe you don't see? I always refer to them as 15, so there's 5%er, 15%ers, and 85%ers. 85%ers are those people who love to go to work, but they don't want the the responsibility of, you know, the extra hours and the, you know, so they don't want to own a business, right? So out of those entrepreneurs, let's say the 15%ers, what are the things that you see they they do that if you could just help them early on, it would help them to be more successful quickly? I think you said it when you mentioned your 23 year old daughter, that she raises her hand and volunteers for something even before she knows what the whole landscape looks like. That I find Sharon, and there's others, but I think fundamentally the ability to have the courage to move forward when you don't see the entire staircase. I want to say this is a Martin Luther King quote. It said, you know, you don't need to see the whole damn staircase. You just need to be able to take the first step and then the next step and then the next step. And over time, the entire staircase reveals itself to you. Mm -hmm. That is a very difficult thing, I think, for entrepreneurs who are typically type A. They're very driven. They're very, mm -hmm. this is my goal and this is how I'm going to get there. So to be able to not know what the full landscape looks like feels very unnerving. Understand the clients that we work with who are corporate refugees, former corporate executives, these are folks who typically have never started a business before. So there's a lot of fear in that. Yeah. Um, the, the book, and in fact, this is the process that we use, it's a six-step process we take our clients through to be able to de-risk franchise ownership for them. Because what's a big part of the fear, Sharon? In addition to, I've never owned a business. 
I don't know what this is going to look like. The second piece is, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose the shirt on my back. Mm -hmm. So this is a way for an individual to be able to go through a very purposeful, intentional process of what we call due diligence to basically understand the different business models that we present to you to better understand what is the right fit franchise for me, given who I am, given the skill sets that I bring to the table, and very importantly, given the kind of life that I want to be able to live with my family. So I'm curious, um, one of the things that we find in the executive search business, and I'm sure you experience this too, and I'm curious what, how you handle it, is when people have been part of a riff, they're one of two things when they come to see me. They're either sad or mad. Yes. And, and it oh, tends yeah. to be one or the other, neither of which are good to make a decision in that emotional mind frame. Yes. So, you know, they're experiencing career burnout. They're just almost paralyzed to move forward. So how do you, how do you get them from sad or mad to, like you said, getting through that, that in-between phase where you're no longer, your ego is not attached to the corporation you worked for, but mm -hmm. you haven't yet decided what is the next life vocation for me. That's How right. do you help people through the sad or mad? What an excellent question, Sharon. Um, I love that, sad or mad. That exactly describes, mm -hmm. I would say, seven out of 10 clients that we help mm -hmm. find a franchise for. Um, I think fundamentally, and clients get very surprised. So they think the very first conversation they have with us, we immediately jump into franchising, right? Here's the brands, Sharon, you know, do, do, do. no. We don't even get to franchises till about the third call. And they're very surprised because that first call, this is what they were expecting. And I said, no, 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 Sharon, let's, let's back up. Walk me through. I, I want to get to know you a little bit better. And my friend, and I know you've experienced this, it is astonishing what people will share with you about themselves if they feel that you are genuinely interested and curious about them. And so they share, and in many ways, it becomes uh, it becomes more a counseling session and less a franchising session, right? Uh, I always but, say we need a degree in psychology. You too, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but that is part of their process. They cannot they cannot see what is possible and what is in front of them because they have not yet let go of the baggage and the burden that they're still carrying with them. Um, I think fundamentally it is also once once they have unloaded and once they have released that to say, okay, Sharon, I understand. It Obviously, it feels like you have been betrayed. You spent X years with your company, right? You grew up with them in a sense and you became a number on their balance sheet and it was convenient for them and they let you go. So here's my question for you, Sharon. Now that we're here, what would you like to do? Because we could absolutely spend a lot, many more hours talking about how you've been wronged and you would be right. But do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And that starts us off in a very different trajectory where they say, no, 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 Faizun, you know, I wanted to share that with you. But look, you know, I'm ready. And I feel like this is the time when I... Finally, I'm going to get the reins of my life back in my own hands. And I will never let anybody lay me off ever again. One time is one time too many. Now you start to see a different spirit mm -hmm. and a different energy yeah. emerge. That, my friend, is what kicks us off. So that's, that's typically what we essentially do. So I have to ask you this question. Um, as a former, 20, 20 years I had a franchise. So a longtime franchise owner. Um, and I would tell you it was fabulous when I was new in the business because all the processes, every, I mean, they made it easy, right? This mm -hmm. is how we make the fries. I always say it's like McDonald's. We all make <laughs> the fries the same way. Yes. So it made it easy when I was new and I really didn't have time to focus on processes. I needed to focus on people. Mm -hmm. Over time, you know, people are going to ask you, so talk to me about the royalties I have to spend and is the return on investment a good one? How do you, how do you counsel them on that? Because I'm sure you get that question a lot. So I'm going to have to spend this much to get this much. Yes. How do I evaluate if that's a good business decision? Absolutely. I love that question. Um, so remember I told you we take our clients through a six-step due diligence process. 
there, I will mention one. One part of the process is what we refer to in the industry as validation. So what's validation? I always say to my clients, and they laugh when I say this because they think I'm joking, but I'm not. I will say, Sharon, don't believe a word I say. Shouldn't believe a word I say. When I introduce you to the franchise brands, don't believe a word they say. And they look at me and they say, well, then what the hell am I doing? And I say, well, do you know who you should believe and where you should take your direction from? As I take you through the process, there's a particular part of the process where you will be introduced to existing franchisees within the brands that I have introduced you to. These are current franchisees. They are running that business today. Am I running the business? No. I know a lot about the business, but at a high level. The brand representative that you're talking to, they work for the brand. They're salespeople for the brand. Of course, they will tell you it is the best thing since sliced bread. Listen, absorb the information, but don't believe anything. When you begin speaking to the franchisees within that particular brand, by the way, these are people, they're never compensated to talk to you. They have spent their own time and their money investing into that brand and they're running that business right now. They will tell you truthfully the good, the bad, and the ugly. So if there's anyone that I would listen to, it would be the franchisees. I will tell you, Sharon, validation, it's one of the six steps of the process we take them through. I call it the heart of the process. This is where you really get the granular details of, okay, well, what does a life in the owner of a franchise of a flower shop look like? I've always wanted to own a flower shop. Okay, well, these are people who are doing that on a daily basis, and they will share with you what that looks like. Was the investment worth it? Did the brand provide the kind of support that they promised you that they would give you before you began? Over the years, depending on how many years they've been in the brand, has the support been consistent? Has it gone down? Has it gone up? These would be the value adds that you would be looking for before you invest into a particular brand to understand the royalty that I'm going to give them every month. What exactly am I paying for? That is the fundamental question that they're that trying to That is such, such great advice and 100% true. I mean, over the years, I've talked to many, a potential um, owner of the franchise, and and it is true. We're, we, we know that we're going to see them if they decide to buy into the franchise. Yes. So we want to make sure that we give them, like you said, the good, the bad, and, and the ugly, for sure. All right. I want to make sure and get you a few questions that uh, I'm dying to know. Um, so you've been extensively honored by Forbes, Huffington Post, and even Tory Burch, which by the way, <laughs> I, I love the foundation as a woman to watch. Fabulous. So what is all this national recognition meant to you? I mean, that's most people strive their whole career to be recognized by these brands. So talk to me about what that's meant. Oh, wow. What a lovely question. Um, I will tell you, in the moment when it happens, it feels great, right? It's a little stroke to the ego. But I think fundamentally, Sharon, here's the thing. I think at a certain point, um, they become vanity metrics, right? It's kind of like, how many people like my mm -hmm. post, right? Mm -hmm. Because it fundamentally doesn't, by itself, do a lot. The bigger, deeper, more meaningful gratification for me is that these national recognitions have really lifted our platform. It's given us um, brand recognition within the industry and outside the industry in a way that on my own, I might not have been able to get. So for that, I'm, I'm always tremendously grateful. And then, you know, the industry awards that we get, uh, we are selected by industry peers. And so that's, that's a different kind of gratification because we are now being recognized for the good work that we're doing within the industry. Yeah. It, you and I think so much alike as far as branding and marketing, it's all about impact. It, it doesn't have anything to do with, here's another plaque. It's the impact you can make on people's lives. And that's the piece 100%. that um, makes a big difference. So you grew up in Asia and Africa. So how did that upbringing influence your perspective and shape you as an individual? Oh, wow. Um, you know, when, when we became pregnant and 
we were excited we were going to have this little baby. My husband, who is half South African, half Zimbabwean, um, and he didn't grow up in this country either. So we have a mini United Nations in our home. And one of the things that he and I have always said is it is so important because the way each of us are, we bring a different set of eyes to the world and to the work we do. And we never wanted our daughter to grow up thinking that this wonderful country we live in is exactly the way the rest of the world lives. That is not true. So to be able to live and work in, uh, at this point in my life, Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, um, it's allowed me to, it's allowed me to look at seemingly disparate dots and be able to connect them. You know, one of the things that we have done for our company, um, it's one of the most, it's the f- funnest things that I do is to be able to create these strategic partnerships, strategic alliances. And many times I've been told, what, who, who are you guys working with? And then they, then they start to see the dots connect. But to be able to do that, um, I think very importantly, Sharon, what that does, um, it allows you to step into the world with kindness. So when you think of the times we are living in, right, if there's anything that anyone needs, everyone needs, is to have a little kindness in their lives, right? It allows us to do that because I might have just met you. I don't know what's going on in your life. Let me give you that little bit of grace. So even if you are not exactly what I had thought you would be or how I would want you to behave with me, let me be able to have the foresight to give you that grace and give you a pass and keep moving. I think those are a couple of the things I feel growing up internationally, growing up across different continents has has at least helped me. With. Has the diverse background, the multinational um, spin you bring and having been um, to multiple countries and lived, does that help you with your business? How has that impacted? Absolutely, because the other piece which we never brought up here in our conversation today, Sharon, is that yes, We work predominantly with clients and candidates in the U.S. and in Canada, but we also work internationally. Mm -hmm. So we have had clients we've placed in businesses that we've franchised in Asia, in Europe, um, in Africa. Uh, We are starting to get a lot more into Latin America. So it's uh, we're not global yet necessarily in in, in terms of our scope, but we're certainly headed that way. Um, I think people at the end of the day, we, when we connect with someone, we connect because we sense some sort of familiarity with them, right? You use the word, you said, you, th- we th- you thought we were soul sisters, right? You sense some connection. I think that is fundamentally what it is, right? It doesn't matter where you're from. Uh, I will probably figure out some point of connection with you. And that just completely changes the trajectory of the conversation from that point. I, you know, it's so interesting. I just got back from Europe and we had um, my women's president organization met in Manchester, England, and we had individuals who were part of parliament and all, all the different fractions of government and business. And it's just such a big world out there. And it's, there's so much opportunity and it's so, yes. um, it, it, to me, I mean, I was I was raised in, in a small community and hadn't been out of the state until I was 21 years mm-hmm. old. And now to be able to travel, there's this whole big world and the things that are out there that are opportunities are just amazing. Um, and I think our young people are, are I hope they they if they don't get anything from us, start traveling early and, and meeting people yes. because it is a wonderful world out there. So um, talking about the younger generation. So. How do you help? I mean, obviously your business isn't just for 50 and over, right? There's a lot of younger people who I'm sure would benefit from from franchising at a younger age as opposed to waiting until they're older. So um, how do you how do you influence that younger generation? Oh, I love that. Um, so, you know, within the you're talking about uh, something that uh, that is very close to my heart. So. At our company. Our social mission initiative is called Franchising for All. And through that initiative, um, we work with undergrad and graduate schools around the country where we come in, we do master classes on 
how to find the right franchise. If you even, you know, if you have even one entrepreneurial bone in your body, um, or if you're a business owner, you you ran a business for a couple of years. Have you ever thought about turning it into a franchise? Uh, we do master classes. We have provided at this point thousands of copies of our book um, to students around the country. Uh, again, my intent is always let's get people earlier on in the system. Let them know as they step into the world of work, whatever work looks like for them, let them understand corporate America is a fantastic option for millions of people, but it is just one option. What are the other paths that you could take? Um, so introducing this concept of entrepreneurship, and again, I always say this, it just doesn't mean franchising. You could start a business on your own and never franchise it, and that is just fine. But entrepreneurship fundamentally is the backbone of our economy. Small business owners are the lifeblood of the economy, right? Mm -hmm. And if more Absolutely. younger people knew that, they would, I think they, they would have yet another, what's the word, another quiver in their bag, another, you know, tool in their toolbox, if you will. As a listener, I, I can't imagine that people aren't thinking, how would you know if your business should be franchised? I mean, how do you know that you have a product that could be duplicated and, and other people start their own franchise doing what it is you do? How do you recommend to someone you have something that should be duplicated, that should be franchised? Absolutely. Oh, I love that question. Um, I think first they should sign up for one of our master classes. They're complimentary, they're free to attend. And this is exactly what we take a deep dive into. But to answer your question in sort of one sentence, and there are a handful of things we look at, obviously, but I would say the biggest acid test of franchisability is, is your business currently profitable? Are you making money? And the answer to this question, Sharon, can only be a yes, my friend. If right. it is anything other than a yes, then let's put a plan together to get you to the stage of profitability. Because at the end of the day, one of the biggest reasons that somebody will give you a certain amount of money, invest in you, and then invest their life energy in growing your business is because you have showed them a path to profitability. Yes, that makes yeah. total sense. So uh, this was lovely and so much awesome. great info, so much great information. But I do, for listeners out there that may want to find you, um, what is the easiest way to find you, Faizun? Absolutely. Um, they can check out our website, thefranchisepros.net. Um, I, my husband says this, he says, I've never met a stranger in my life. So reach out to me. I have been told also now, I don't know if this is true. I have been told that there's only one Faizun Kamal on LinkedIn. So apparently it's not super hard to find me. I live on LinkedIn. Send me a message there or contact us through the website. Um, I'm just always delighted to chat with people. It's unbelievable, Sharon, the kinds of things people around the world are doing. So I'm, I'm always up for a chat with anyone. Well, and and you have a tremendous LinkedIn presence, which is is how initially I found you. And I have to say, you're probably one of the best dressed LinkedIn um, people I also <laughs> see. So you have a fabulous wardrobe of which I'm jealous. So Faizun, this was amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, I, again, let's stay connected because it, this has just been delightful. I love it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sharon. Take care. Bye now.